Well, back over Christmas break, uh, while the kids were home, I took the time to read a book I've been wanting to read for a while. The book was called The Feuds of Eastern Kentucky. I know, sounds like a weird book to be reading, but it was an important book to be to me because my family, through my mom's mom, is in that book. My grandma, my mom's mom, was from Bloody Breathitt, Bloody Breathitt County, Kentucky. Now, when you think about the feuds of Eastern Kentucky, you think about the Hatfields and McCoys, right? And that was a real feud. Well, my family. The Littles made them look tame. We were involved in not one, not two, but three feuds. And the author of the book called us a bunch of thugs, which as I read the book, I realized was probably true. But as I read, I started to get interested in the sociology of the whole thing. You know, most of the feuds in Eastern Kentucky started right after the end of the Civil War, and they were often fought between families that were on the same side in the war. They weren't battles between those who were on the Confederate side and those who were on the, on the Union side. They were often families that fought together on one side or the other uh, during the war. Sometimes perceived slights and things like that played a role, but most of those feuds were started by something deeper was almost always a desire for control. Sometimes it was political control. Sometimes it was control of a local business or type of business or commerce. And they weren't dumb hillbillies. Most of the people involved were well-educated businessmen and lawyers who had college degrees. Not all of them, but many. Nobody trusted the law enforcement and criminal justice systems. You know, you could kill someone illegally, you could be sentenced to life in prison, serve a few years, and then be pardoned by the next governor and out at home. And it happened over and over and over again. So people tended to take matters of justice into their own hands. So in the counties of eastern Kentucky, families often became like little kingdoms, authorities to themselves each doling out their own justice and seeking revenge as they saw fit. Some families chose to live under the laws of their county, their state, their nation. Many of them wanted peace and less bloodshed. Others did not. They chose to walk their own path by their own set of rules. They weren't always lawless, but when it came to getting the control that they wanted, They lived by their own law. They did their own thing. They doled out their own justice as they saw fit. I want you to think about your life as a kingdom this morning. And the extent of that kingdom is is that place and those places where you have a deciding voice. It's that area over which you yourself have legitimate control, legitimate authority. Now, some people try to extend their control and become controlling of others, but that's usually not a legitimate thing. The only place where you have legitimate control is over yourself, right? Over your own life. I I talk to my kids about that all the time. I say, we can't always control what happens to us, but I can control how I respond to it, right? And that's a good lesson for all of us to learn because there's a lot that I can't control that happens in this life. But it's me and my responses and and those things that, that I have control of. That's your kingdom, your life, the area where your will reigns. Now this spring we've been walking through the parables of Luke and we've been, a parable is simply a story that has a deeper application and in Jesus' case, the parables are about the kingdom of God. And he uses events and, and things from our experience to illustrate what the kingdom of God is like. And today we're going to close that series by looking at one of the last parables Jesus told before his crucifixion. He's already entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey in victory as the people shouted his praise and laid palm branches on the ground in front of him. And he had gone into the temple and driven out those who sought to take advantage of of others by turning over the tables of the money changers. And now he's teaching with authority in the temple. 
And it's those three things that have drawn the attention of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling religious authority in Jerusalem. It was made up of the chief priests and the, and the uh, scribes, the teachers of the law, and the, the elders of the people. And as he teaches in the temple, this group approaches him and they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is it that gave you this authority? Who do you think you are is what they're asking him. That's what they're asking. But, but those in authority, by whose authority did you march into Jerusalem like a king? By whose authority did you upset the booths here in the temple? And by whose authority are you teaching? You see, unlike the other rabbis, Jesus wasn't just quoting somebody else when he taught. When the other rabbis taught, they would say something like, Rabbi Akiba says this, but Rabbi Judah says this, and Rabbi Simeon permits this, and they would go back through this long line of authority as they taught. And Jesus didn't do that. He was teaching as someone who actually had authority in himself. That's, why the, the, what, that's what stunned the people and, the, and raised the ire of the religious leaders. Who's given you the authority to do these things and to say these things? But Jesus wasn't about to get drawn into their game. If you have your Bibles, turn with you to Luke chapter 20. And we're going to be looking at verses uh, 9 through 18. But back up in, in, in the first part of the chapter, in verse 4, after they've asked him, by whose authority are you doing this? Jesus, who's not going to get sucked into their game this time, he asks them this question. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. If you answer this one, then I'll answer yours. And he says, was John the Baptist's baptism, was the baptism of John from heaven or was it from a man? And they're stuck. They're stuck because they hadn't themselves responded to the teaching of John the Baptist the way many of the common people had. They hadn't been baptized. They hadn't responded positively to God's message through John to repent. And so they said if it was from God, they, they'd have to answer as to why they hadn't responded to the call themselves. But if they said it was from man, just a human thing, God wasn't in it, the people would be upset because they saw John as a prophet. So they said, we don't know. And so Jesus refused to answer their question, then I'm not going to tell you by whose authority I'm doing these things. But then he told them this parable. Look at Luke chapter 20, verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and led it out to tenants and went out into another country for a long time. And when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruits of the vineyard. But the tenants beat that servant, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, what will I do? I'll send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And then verse 19 says, The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. But they feared the people. In this parable, he talks about a vineyard. Of all the national and religious symbols used by the Jews throughout history, the vine was probably the most significant. It was stamped on their coins. The image of the vine was at the core of their psyche and it was at the core of their identity as a nation. Throughout the Old Testament, 
the entire Old Testament, the nation of Israel had, had been depicted as a vineyard lovingly planted and tended by God. Nowhere is that image more powerful than Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. If you want to flip over there, you can. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. This is God speaking. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded only wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, what did it yield but wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls and it shall be trampled down. The vineyard was Israel's self-identity. It was the identity that God had given to them. This, is, this was a powerful symbol to them similar to our own stars and stripes or the Statue of Liberty or, or the bald eagle was deeply embedded in their national history. By the way, kids are dismissed to Sunday school. <laughs> you know, my wife will just yell at me and say, Jeff, dismiss the kids. Tish is just sitting down there very quietly waiting for me to realize that she's still sitting here. Yes, we'll celebrate Tish's birthday too. But the vineyard was something that was deeply embedded, the image of the vineyard in their national history. In the temple at Jerusalem, above and around the gate, extending 115 feet into the air, there was this richly carved vine extending as a border and decoration. The branches and the tendrils and the leaves were pure gold, the finest gold. The stalks of the bunches of the, of the grapes were made up of costly jewels and they were the length of a human body. Herod placed it there. And rich and patriotic Jews from time to time added to it, adding a, a, a jewel or a leaf of gold. This vine had an uncommon importance and a sacred meaning in the eyes of the Jews. At night, it was illuminated by candles and torches, and it was a spectacular sight. That image was right there as Jesus told this story. The people could see it. And everyone knew who the characters were. It was right out of Isaiah 5. The man who planted the vineyard was God. And in Jesus' day, that landowner could go away and rent out his land to tenant farmers and expect about a quarter to a half of the crop in return. That would have been his share. And the tenant farmers were the people of Israel, specifically the leaders, but the whole nation is in view here. And the servants of the landowner were the prophets. Throughout Israel's history, God had sent his prophets to speak his word to the people, but their message was consistently rejected. And God says over and over again in Isaiah that I planted this vineyard and I expected it to grow and I tended it and I took care of it and I expected this great crop from it and all I ever got was wild grapes. Not the cultivated crop that I was looking for. And so God sent his prophets to, to correct the people, to, to, to turn them back to him, and they were consistently rejected. In fact, some, in some ways, being called to be a true prophet of God was a kind of a death sentence. Elijah was driven into the wilderness by the monarchy. The king and his wife didn't want to hear what Elijah had to say. Isaiah was sawn in half. Zechariah was stoned to death in the temple near the altar. And in Jesus' day, John the Baptist was beheaded. But you know, it wasn't really the prophets who were being rejected. 
Had they never spoken the word of God, they would have been fine. It was the word of God, the truth of God, God himself that people were rejecting. It was the authority of God that they didn't like and that they were turning away from. So in this parable, the owner sent his own son. If they don't respect my servants, surely they'll respect my son. And the son is Jesus himself. And when they saw him coming, they said, this is the heir, let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. Jesus was actually explaining what was about to happen in Jerusalem and his disciples missed it. You see, in that day, if the landlord had been gone for three successive years without returning, it was assumed that he'd either lost interest or um, didn't care anymore and the tenants could claim the land. And so the appearance of, son, of the son might have given them the idea that their landlord was dead, so kill the heir and the land is yours, right? So what were they really rebelling against? It was the authority of the landowner. They wanted to submit to no one's authority but their own. They were denying the owner his claim to the vineyard. They were saying, yeah, this might be your land, this might be your farm, but we don't want anything to do with you. They wanted to be known as the people of God. They wanted the blessings, they wanted the benefits, but they didn't want him to exert his authority over them. They didn't want him to say, this is how I want you to live. They wanted all the blessings, but none of the responsibility. They didn't want to have to bear fruit. And whenever, they, whenever God did exert his authority over them through the prophets, even through his own son, they beat up or killed the messengers. And now they were about to commit not homicide, but deicide. They were about to kill the son of God himself. They wanted to be the people of God but they wanted nothing to do with the rule and reign and authority of God. I think that's where a lot of us are. We all want a God who blesses, who accepts, who forgives, who strengthens, who provides hope and healing and comfort. And God does all of those things. Some of us, fewer, some of us are willing to admit that we need a savior that we're filled with sin and need to be forgiven. But no one wants a king. No one wants a Lord. We all want to be a Lord unto ourselves. I want all the blessings, Jesus, but I still want to be able to live and do things my way to exert my own authority, not bow my knee before yours. And God has allowed you to have your kingdom that's what it means to have free will. Just like the citizens of Eastern Kentucky, just like my family, you can do what you want. But life is best when what you want falls in line with what God wants. To live in the kingdom of God is to bring your kingdom into God's kingdom. To submit your life to God as the ultimate sovereign. It's to acknowledge a higher loving grace-filled authority. It's to say, you know, I'm free to do what I want. Now, there'll be consequences. But I'm free to do what I want. I can accept or reject God's authority in my life. I can choose to recognize no other authority than my own if I wish. That's my right as a human being with free will. Now, again, there will be consequences. But I can choose to go my own way. Or I can choose to submit to God's rule in my life because God's way is best. And the door to that kingdom is a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. That great golden vine in the temple that was 115 feet high, it actually covered the entrance from the holy place, into the holy place from out on the porch where the people gathered. It was the entrance to the presence of God from the holy place. And when Jesus said, I'm the vine and you are the branches, he was actually saying, I am the way into the presence of God. 
And when you are connected to me, my life will flow into you and transform you from the inside out. He was, that's actually a, a two-sided claim that Jesus made when he said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Because the vine in the temple protected the entrance to the holy place, the, temp, the, the presence of God. When Jesus said, I'm the vine, he was saying, I'm the entrance. I'm the way inside. We don't get that because we don't have a temple and we don't have a big grapevine and we don't know what it means and we don't know what it understands. But the people who were hearing Jesus speak knew exactly what he was saying. And he was saying, I'm the way into the presence of God. And if you remain connected to me, my life will flow through you and you will bear fruit. As we live in the kingdom of God, over time, we begin to kind of do by nature those things that please God. We kind of grow into our citizenship in that kingdom. And at that point, we don't need a list of laws to guide us because Jesus is living through us, transforming us. And the invitation of Christ isn't simply to come and be forgiven and then go on about your business as if nothing had happened and continue to live life your own way. It's to come and be connected to the vine and allow his life to begin to flow through you, transforming you. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Now remember that I said your kingdom is that area over which you have legitimate control. You're responsible for every area of your life, your kingdom, but you may not be aware of some things going on in your life. You're only free to respond when you're paying attention to and aware of what motivates your actions. But one of the things Jesus does is he brings those dark areas of our lives, those motivations that we aren't aware of, he brings those under his authority and rule as well. He brings the dark areas into the light so that we can submit them to him too. That's the full extent of his transformation in you. He, he begins with the things you're aware of, the things you know about, the things you know you struggle with. And then he begins making you aware of things that you weren't so aware of. Because though he wants those areas of your life to come under his authority as well. Sometimes he does that through life experiences. Something happens that exposes an area of darkness and sin in our lives. Maybe it's something that someone or several someone says to you. Kind of a recurring theme. Maybe something comes to your attention because you're practicing some spiritual discipline. You know, you're already forgiven, but that area or those areas of your life that still need to be transformed come into the light. And we begin to open those areas of our lives up to him and he begins to transform them. You know, one of the spiritual disciplines that we practice in the, in the Apprentice series, which is a small group, a three, uh, a three session small group experience that we go through here at the church. It lasts for 18 months, three 10 week sessions. One of the spiritual disciplines we practice is fasting. But it isn't from food. It's a fast from gossip. Many of us can easily go without a meal if we really try. Or we can go on a media fast, or these days it's popular to go on a social media fast and try to stay off Facebook for a couple of days. Try going without gossip. That'll shine the light on some areas of your life. And it, it'll do it in a hurry. It sure did for me. To try to go an entire 24 hour period without talking about anybody in a negative way when they're not present. That was hard. Sure opened my eyes to how often I do it. And I, I had no idea. That's God shining his light on an area of darkness in my life. Whose authority are you under? Is it your own? Still, even after all these years of following Christ, wanting blessing and peace and happiness and joy, but not 
transformation? Or have you, or are you bringing your life into the kingdom of God and submitting your life to his authority? And then Jesus says this, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's talking about himself. The one who would be rejected, the one who would be thrown out, the one who would be cast aside has become the cornerstone, the key part of the kingdom of God. He's saying, I am the authority. Allow my life to flow into and through you. Craig was a zoo architect. It was a job that required him to travel a lot. And one day, he and one of his coworkers were flying back to the States from Germany, and they got stuck in the Atlanta airport. Ever been stuck in the Atlanta airport? And they were told their flight home would be delayed for several hours. Ever been there? How'd you handle it? Airports are not great places to wait. Those hours passed and a few more and they were finally told the flight had been canceled. And the delay, delay meant there weren't any more options to get home that night. And they'd have to spend the night in Atlanta. Now, as you can imagine, the anger on the concourse was growing quickly. All the passengers were forced into a long line to rebook their flights, and Craig and his colleagues stood in line and watched as each person spoke harshly to the woman who was trying to help them. And when it was Craig's turn, he, he, he looked at the young woman, and before she could speak, he said, I promise I'm not going to be mean to you. Her face immediately softened, and she said softly, thank you. And their exchange was pleasant, and he got their flights booked for the next day. And as they walked down the concourse, Craig was smiling despite his disappointment. He missed his wife. He missed his kids. He wanted to be home. He didn't want to spend the night in Atlanta. But he was smiling. And his friend who had been watching him said, Craig, I've known you for a long time. A year ago, you would have been enraged by what we went through today. And you would have lit into that woman at the counter. And Craig said, you know what? You're right. But I've changed. I know who I am and I know where I am. I'm a person in whom Christ dwells and I live in the kingdom of a God who loves me and is caring for me. I'm frustrated, but I'm still at peace. We'll get home tomorrow. I don't know what your area of hang up might be. Those areas that still aren't really submitted to the authority of Christ. I know what they are for me. Raising teenagers will reveal them to you quickly. But I don't know what they are for you. For Craig, it was impatience and anger and wanting his way. But he's bringing his life under the authority of Jesus Christ. And things that he used to trip and stumble over, he no longer does. Is he perfect? No. But he's being transformed by Jesus Christ. That's what it means to live in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is present for you now. It's not just something that's coming in the future when Christ returns. It's not just something that's come, coming in the future when we die and pass on to the next life. It's present for you now. That was Jesus' message over and over again. The kingdom of God is here now. It's present for you now insofar as your kingdom has been brought under the authority of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. We'll live fully in that kingdom when Christ returns and he establishes it in his fullness. But for now, it's available to you insofar as you bow your knee before Jesus Christ. And I'm not just talking to those of us who, already know, who don't know Christ. I'm talking to those who do follow Christ. 
Where are you in this parable? Are you under the authority of the landlord, willingly doing his work, looking for and longing for his return? Or have you given up hope that he'll ever come back and just begun to do your own thing? Or have you refused his leadership from the beginning? Father in heaven, we pray that prayer, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So often, Lord, I think we as your people don't really know what that means. Because we haven't bowed our knee before you. We haven't submitted to your authority in our lives. We haven't really connected to you, the vine, and allowed your transforming power to flow into us. Your life and your light to flow into us. Lord, I pray, as we close this service this morning, that you would open our eyes to see those, those areas of our lives where we still haven't submitted to you, where you want to transform. Lord, we know that you're not calling us to be good people. You're calling us to be transformed by your spirit at work in us. So give us the courage and the strength to submit our will to yours so that we can truly pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and not my own. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.